Thank you so much for the kind introduction. Thank you for having me here, um, for inviting me to come. We'll spend the next hour together. I'll hopefully not speak too quickly, which I have a tendency to do. Uh, the good thing is I have my wife here to stop me. <laughs> um, so, to start off, you just gave the preface for everything that we try to do at the Center for Business History in Stockholm, which sounds like an official institution, but is not. We are very much a commercial entity. I'll throw that out right away. The way we uh, fund ourselves is by selling our services. We sell our archive services to companies. And in order to do that, we have to persuade them that they need an archive. And actually, we need to persuade them that they need to keep their history. So my talk today is going to be a lot about the arguments we use to persuade them that history is important to them. And if you need to persuade a company for something about something, you need to persuade them on a commercial basis. So this is all about commercial badgering. <laughs> One company that we don't need to badger, because they got it, um, uh, and it's the first of many Swedish examples, but hopefully you'll recognize the brands, <laughs> <laughs> is this company, um, whose founder just died uh, a little over a year ago, in my company. Uh, they have, in their archives, because they're a corporation that actually have their own archive, with two archivists, plus a corporate museum, open to the public, but in the archive, this is a note that hangs on the door. This is how they remind themselves, everybody who comes into the archive gets to read that statement. And for those in the way back, I'll read it. This is why we at IKEA need our history, because history moves us forward. History creates emotions. History is a way of life. History makes us more curious. History gives context, credibility. It comforts. History makes employers interesting to employees. History creates goodwill. And the marketplace is full of <coughs> history conscious competitors who will be using their history. History simply strengthens your brand. <coughs> Now, the archive team at IKEA also needs to convince the budget makers to increase budgets, etc. And they keep using these arguments internally. And over time, they've amassed an archive and a collection. You can't imagine how many versions of Billy the Bookcase there are. <laughs> <laughs> Plus the drawings that came with it. Plus the sales figures for different companies. <coughs> Plus the production plan. What? When was the company founded? Um, 70, 69 years ago. Yeah. They're turning 70 next year. So IKEA gets it. Um, a few words about where I work. Um, Center for Business History in the outskirts of Stockholm. We are a purely Swedish enterprise. We take care of Swedish business history. And I said we are a commercial entity. We are, in fact, actually organized as a, uh, uh, an NGO, a non-government organization. Uh, and in Sweden, that means that you're owned by your members. The members, in our case, are the companies who deposit with us. So we don't have shareholders to account for, or that hold us accountable. Our members actually hold us accountable. The companies who leave their legacy in, in our hands. You'll probably hear me misspeak a couple of times today. I'll be say, talking about our archives. They are not our, ours. They are still the archives of each depositing company. We are an outsourced archive solution for them, caretakers of their material. And so far, we're taking care of about 7,000 Swedish companies. We think, we're not actually sure. <laughs> There's about 70,000 shelf meters, and I don't know how many terabytes. Uh, and in that material hides a lot of companies, because we simply haven't gone through all the material yet. 
especially insurance companies and banks have bought up so many different companies over the years that you have to go through each one to find them. the legacy companies that goes into a, a brand today. As I said, we're a non-profit org with commercial activities. There's about 40 of us. Uh, in Sweden, at least, very few companies today have their own archivists, so we become a place where archivists can actually work and have colleagues. <laughs> You're not the lone archivist at a place. You can share best practices amongst uh, editors. I'll get into the storytelling part. We have archival services, a service desk for retrieval and for uh, the questions that come from the companies. Then we have the editorial services that I run. And this is the big announcement. I'm not an archivist. I'm a PR and communication guy, which is why they hired me. <laughs> said, we, need to it up. we also have a research group, is a big word for two people. Um, but for most of our assignments, we charge directly to a company. But given that we have so many different companies as historical material. There are more stories in there that a specific company wouldn't fund, but that we want to tell. Um, that's when we, our research director goes uh, on application hunting type for funds uh, from various, uh, from various groups. And we've been doing this since 1974. At the end I'll get back to where 1974, but this is my segue into the whole idea of age. In 1974, what happened then? Well, the year before, Timberland started. I know that because Timberland prints on every shirt they have established 1973. And just think about how many of those established since that companies actually do use. Here's the oldest brand in the world, allegedly. It's the Swedish one we're proud of. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Here's a toy store that's glad that they've been selling toys since 1760. Emily's in London. Actually, if you walk in the streets of London, you'll see it everywhere. This is on St. James's Street, a bookseller since 1797. It's important to them, they've been in business for so long. Across the street is the oldest wine merchant, Mary Brothers and Rudd. They were established in the 17th century, 1698. So they just squeezed in. <laughs> and that's now on for a director that's been doing that since 1526. This is all on the same street, St. James's Street. A competition in who's oldest. A Swedish betting company. They've been around since 1852. For Sweden, that's pretty good because we actually didn't get freedom of enterprise until 1864. So most of our companies are young. Um, here's another Swedish company, not even 10 years. I think it's important that wherever they go, they give their establishment a year. And it's not just consumer goods, this is driving through our, through our country house on the highway. This is a B2B business, a logistics business. They're happy that they've been transporting goods between Sweden and Finland since 1948. The fact that you've been doing it for a long time seems to matter. And what's long for you differs. I mean, the soccer company was only 10 years old. This becomes a nerd obsession of mine. <laughs> I see it everywhere. This is a pizza place in London. This is a uh, Rolls place in Delhi, a restaurant in Croatia. But well, once you start seeing them, you can not see them anymore. <laughs> this is <laughs> yesterday. By the way, they're turning 100 next year. It's taking care of their history. <laughs> yeah, this was lunch today. Or yesterday. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. They're everywhere. And some gears carry more significance than others. This is a South African brand. We 
all may remember what happened in 94. Apartheid was abolished. Mandela came to power. We're a company that started with new South Africa. So a lot can be held in that small establishing sense. Of course, there are those who try to make themselves somewhat older than they may be. Uh, Clear Channel, the American outdoor advertising company, claimed in Sweden that they've been outdoors pioneers since 1879, which is strange because the company was founded in Texas in 74. <laughs> <laughs> but they bought Swedish outdoor advertising companies. And one of them had a printing press originating, originating in 79. So in Sweden, they made claim to this. And actually, I make fun of them a bit, but who's to say that they're wrong? At some point, you have to decide what is part of my history and what is not. Here's a favorite of mine. This is a, clo uh, a food store, pretty close to where we live. Uh, and we pass by fairly often, and I can assure you it's not been there since 1977. It's a woman who runs it. It's for low carb, high fat, LCHF food. She's born 1977. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Been thinking about that since she was born in 1977. Here's another one where you start questioning, or at least want to have a discussion with them on how they thought. Old Ebbet Grill is a restaurant pretty close to the White House. Um, they claim they've been in operation since 1856. There has been an old Ebbet Grill since 1856, but in a different location originally. It's moved three or four times until it ended up here. It's changed ownership four or five times. So how much of left, if, if somebody from 1856 came now, would they recognize that place? It becomes almost like that story of the great-grandchild who inherits his great-grandfather's axe. <coughs> where the blade was changed by his father, and the, what do you call it, the, the, handle. the handle was changed by the, great, uh, by the grandfather. Yeah. How much is less left of the axe, the original. What I do like about all these companies, though, even if I make fun of them, is that they do have a sense of history, or at least that history might be important to them. Some of them may not go any longer, or any deeper, any further than just putting in that name, or the, the year. But they seem to have a sense that history supports future. History and your future points in the same direction. Whereas, uh, we all may know, not everybody believes that. <laughs> and here is the somewhat depressing segment of my presentation. Here are all the arguments you're going to hear for why history is not important. And you may recognize some of them. Here's one that I read in the newspaper. A CEO who got fired. <laughs> Didn't really want to talk about it. To only rely on historical data is like driving a car using only the rear view mirror. But the road is clear behind you doesn't mean it's clear ahead. Are more relevant, <clears throat> but it sort of leaves out the fact that history informs who you are. Here's an old one some of you may recognize. History is more or less bunk. We don't want tradition. We want to live in the present, and the only history that is worth a tinker's dam is the history that we make today. Said by Henry Ford. In 1960. Interestingly, Ford just hired their first, they've had archivists for a long time, they've hired their first chief archivist slash chief storyteller. Uh, Ted Ryan, who came to them from Coca Cola, who had been doing the same for the past 30 years. So the, we all hear these variations when we try to explain what an archive is or why it's important, why we when we, as archivists or archive institutions, try to get funding for budgets, it's like, yeah, that's important, but there are a couple of things more important. The campaign for this next quarter. Uh, 
then to depress us even more, here are three more arguments why history isn't valuable. First one, this is actually an economic uh, concept, uh, national economics, the concept of path dependency. There's one track to follow. It doesn't really matter how I got here, because it's the track I'm on and it's the track I'm going to continue on. It's all about, it doesn't matter how much, how much work I put into my previous miles, it's all about the coming miles. But then every now and then somebody comes around and says, well, I'll skip that. Yeah. I'll freestyle it. This is my cross-country explanation of what normally looks like that. It's the theory behind path dependency. And you'll hear some people argue, not knowing that they're arguing using path dependency, but they feel locked in by the past. They feel that they can't do anything about it, so why bother? I might as well just focus on what's here and now. And they might be in this phase and realize that they can actually break out and start something new. But they'll probably be doing that without considering where they came from. So that's argument number one against path dependency. Argument number two is what's in this one. Skeletons in your closet. Thank you. <laughs> Example, this is Pippi Longstocking. Yeah. I'm sure this book's a bastard lady. It has nothing to do with anything that I just wanted to do. <laughs> She's strong and she pushes forward. <laughs> Plus, we're working very much with the, the uh, film production company that made those movies. Uh, returning it next year. We believe this. But more and more companies actually will subscribe to that and not that history points the other way that you have to make a choice. The history supports your future. And now for the cases. How are we doing on time? Another 15 minutes? Yeah. Yep. I may not be able to run through them all. But we'll do a few. This, this is actually how companies then they don't just subscribe to the idea of actively using your authentic history. Do it. So how did, for instance, Ericsson do it? Here's one example. Uh, and I have to give you the background on Ericsson's story. <laughs> His founding. Uh, 1876, Lars Magnus Ericsson founds a repair shop, a mechanical repair shop. In this little back alley in Central Stock. He's been in his 30s. He is just married. He's 34. He just married a 17-year-old. And get special permission from the courts. Uh, but I can assure you that he stayed married the entire time because Hilda built the company with him. And we realized this because the, the origin story for Ericsson for a very long time was that Lars Magnus came up with this idea of how to make phones because somebody left a phone in his repair shop, uh, made by Alexander Graham Bell. And he figured out a way to fix that phone, and he thought, I can make a better phone than Bell. And to his great luck, Bell had patented all over the world except Sweden and a few other countries. So he could actually do that. And Sweden was a very deregulated uh, telegraph market at that point, so people could start telegraphs slash phone systems very easily. So there were a lot of phone lines built in Stockholm, and there was a market for it. And that was the origin of the story for a very long time. And then we started looking, not just we, but a lot of people started looking at was he, how alone was he in this? You could find the other men around him. So there were business transactions. But after a while, we stumbled upon these letters, which are letters between him and his wife, Hilda, that he's writing to her when he's out traveling. And she's at home and writes back. She's at home in the kitchen, probably. Three kids running the company from the kitchen while he's out selling. And we found her a different handwriting in the ledger. They had a, a the, the first ledger lasted, it's a fairly thin book actually, we have it in the archives, it lasted 10 years. And the handwriting changes somewhere through the first two years. And we recognize now that it's her handwriting. She starts taking Sweden at the time, women were not emancipated, she didn't have the right to vote, she was uh, a 
minor as a married woman, but she could run this company with him if she did it this way. And these letters are beautiful letters on the note of she writes to him wherever he is and she says, oh, the kids miss you and this happened with your, your mother. And by the way, Engineer Anderson came with a different invoice than he promised, so I'm going to refute that. <laughs> And Ericsson, when they turned 140, decided <clears throat> they wanted to do something with the story. They wanted to do something about with her in it. So they made this movie. My beloved Hilda arrived here in London yesterday from Paris. I'll tell her in the forefront, and we have not yet seen an exchange matching ours. Many kisses and greetings from your husband to you and our little ones. Dear Lars Magnus, I was so happy to receive your letter. Our sales partner visited today, asking for double blueprints of each drawing. Many letter kisses from your devoted Hilda. Chicago. Gustav cannot quite understand you can receive letters. As I have told him that you are so very far away. Now I will take this letter to the post box at the station. Dear Elder, I miss you and the children endlessly. But I remind myself often of the good our work will bring to so many. cannot express how much I miss you. I only wish we could see each other again soon. Dear Elder, we recently employed new and experienced workers who can build up the company we need. They will be able to build the equipment and deliver it to many more people faster than we have in the past. Dear Lars Magnus, I do hope it will be possible for us to achieve more and find the strength to meet the challenges in the future. Show this at the 140th anniversary at the headquarters, not a dry eye in the house. Mm -hmm. yeah. So here's how you can take, I think what they did was really smart. You take words from 140 years ago, you put today's pictures on them, and you realize it's not that different. It's the same challenges we face. The technological solutions from 1880 is not going to solve today's. But the thought processes and challenges are there. So Ericsson did that. Let's do another one. Ika, which is a retailer in Sweden. They are everywhere. Uh, 2,000 stores in a small country. You can't go anywhere without finding Ika. Ika is where we go to find buy our groceries uh, and have done for generations. They actually turned 100 last year, which we helped them communicate by doing, making four magazines. What's special about Ica is that they're not a franchise solution. It's not that each uh, store is just reporting either a franchise or hired by a central organization. The funny solution with Ica is that each Ica store is its own entity. And the store manager is the owner of that Inc. And all the stores together actually own 
central, uh, the central provider of all the goods. And the individual shops are free to get their goods from the central ECA or for somebody else if they get a better price there. They're also free to compete with each other in the local market. Very strange idea. <laughs> but it's worked for 100 years. It does create some friction between central ECA, who are tired of their, their, their tradespeople. And the traders, tradespeople are tired of centralized ECA. But that's a friction that should be there. So we helped them communicate with the shop owners. We didn't help them with their anniversary uh, communication in the stores, which of course they had. On the actual day that they turned under, they gave everybody a free cake, things like that. But we helped them through four magazines, one in each quarter during the anniversary year, that was sent to all the shop owners. They actually got five each, so they could keep one and give four to or to employees in the store. To remind them this is how we worked before. We fought them too. We had troubles with each other and we worked them out. Here's a problem we had in the 30s, here's a problem we had in the 60s. And we came to that, and they did that in not only the magazines. Here's another good thing, if you tell the story well, you can tell it in different formats. The magazine was one, but the articles there also went on a website, on a uh, timeline that they printed all over their headquarters. And they even did a little cabaret that they toured the local distribu distribution centers. Telling the same story. Seems a little quaint, a little odd, works great in that corporate culture. And all that, all those various stories were born here in an Excel sheet. <laughs> So we went through that exercise with them. We said, what are your future problems? What are some of the themes that you're working on right now? And we, not that you could read, and it would be in Swedish anyway, but here are the five themes we came up with for them. How has the cooperation between Central and the individual tradespeople worked? How has shopping or retailing developed in Sweden? And what role has ECA played in that? What food have we been selling? Etc. And then we mapped for each year, these are the years, we just mapped events. Incredibly boring Excel sheets. <laughs> <laughs> but once you've done that exercise, you have all the goods. You have the actual facts and you can start narrating and again turn it into this. So that was ECAP. Swarovski, we'll do that one, two, and then round off. Swarovski, uh, Austrian example. Crystal cutter. If you travel and you're in an airport, you'll probably see some of their goods because they're sold primarily there. They are also a, that's their consumer offer. They're also a B2B provider of cut glass. They make, they can make cut glass look like crystal. And they have a, an archivist, Stephanie Bonsack. And what I'm about to explain is just because I listened to her. She came to talk at, at a conference. And not only did she talk, she showed this movie. And I'm going to show you, it's about four minutes. It's her way of reminding her stakeholders internally why they need the archive. So it's actually, whenever budget negotiations come up, she shows this movie. <laughs> it looks like this. <coughs> Thank you. 
focusing on one piece of their, his, of their business more than another. She focuses on the consumer facing. She focuses on the objects more than the documents that are also in the archive. So she's chosen how to tell her story in order for the most effect. Uh, I think the bigger business for Swarovski is the B2B business where they just sell ready-made cuts to other companies who sell them under their own brands. So that's her. We are, in the interest of time, moving forward. A few final slides. I've already talked about us at length, so I'm just going to skip to this. So what are, if we're looking into our future, what do we see as archivists and archive institutions and, and a couple of the challenges that we struggling with, with. One is this. <laughs> We're not struggling with Spotify. <laughs> but we use them as, as an example of how are we going to convince young companies that their history is already worth preserving. Spotify is 10 years. Uh, if you're in the gaming, if you like games, you play World of Warcraft, Dice Industries is a Swedish company that, that did a lot part of that. Their history we'd like to say. How do we convince a young company that it's time already? So that's a challenge we have. Uh, we've noticed that family-owned businesses tend to interest themselves in their history when the founder is about to retire. That's a good cue. But how do we get these venture capital-owned companies to interest themselves in that history? Uh, Spotify, who's growing across the world, want to keep a Spotify culture. We talk to them every now and then, since they're headquartered in Stockholm, and we say that your culture shouldn't, the old expression, oh, the culture's in the walls. It shouldn't be in the walls, it should be out there in <coughs> stories, and you have stories to tell already. So that's one challenge for all of us. The other challenge is this. <laughs> <coughs> there has never, at any company, I dare say, been a chief history officer, chief archive officer. Somebody in top management or middle management has taken on the responsibility because they felt a personal obligation almost to keep stuff. And in an analog world, things were left over. And a good archivist can reconstruct the context of those things if they get their hands on them. So even if there never was a chief history officer, things were left over and we could still collect them and, and turn them into archives. In a digital world, people are wiping stuff. So we don't even get their, our hands on them. The, the presentations that are nowadays PowerPoints, the correspondence, that beautiful correspondence between Lars Magnus and Hilda is today emails. And there are the the irony of it is that there are tools for this, and some companies are using those tools for digital preservation. A lot of companies have um, digital asset, asset management systems or document handling systems. Those are easier to talk through for us, because they have the systems in place and we basically try to work with them to get some of those documents that are already in, in systems. Some of them should also end up in the digital archive. But we are fearing that if in 10 years we succeed in persuading Spotify that their history is worth telling, there's no data or facts to actually work with in that. So I think that is, and that is a challenge I know all of us have. So we, we keep working with that. That said, final slide, second final. I want to end on a good note. 
there's a lot of talk about history in the, in the archive and in the business world. There's an anniversary marketing summit at the History Factory. They hold every uh, spring in Chicago, where they invite companies to listen to other companies about how they've used their history for anniversary purposes. Indirectly by selling them that they should be using the story, indirectly selling them the archive. There's a business archive council in London, British Business Archives Council. They meet every fall. Again, uh, same type of discussions. The Society of American Archivists, it's a terrible logo, or a sketchy logo that I found, a good logo, but terrible rendition. Business archive sections, they have annual meetings, they talk about this. The European Business History Association, there's one as well, they meet, uh, next time it's going to be in Vienna. Um, the International Council on Archives, who just had their big annual meeting in Cameroon, but they have various sections. One section is on business archives, and they meet once a year. Again, the same things we're talking about. And we give our contribution to it. We have a history marketing summit once a year um, in Stockholm. So there is talk out there. Uh, and as we work, work as individual archivists or archive institutions, and we feel a little lonely at times, struggling for our budgets to meet, there are others fighting the good fight out there too. And, and so keep, if you have a chance, and if you work in the archive industry, try to go out there and, and meet them as much as you can. And if you get a chance, come visit us anytime. Mm -hmm. You won't see this, but this is, because <laughs> they tore that down in 1899, <laughs> two years after the World Expo that we had. You had the other great one here. Yeah. Yes. But do come visit whenever you get a chance. We'd love to see you. Thank you so much for having me. My question you can all talk about with each other is, what's the future model? What's the sustainability of the archives that you hold in stewardship? How does that play out over the next 20 years, or next 50 Take years? Over, right? Yeah, it's a long-term question. But I just want to say thank you again to Anders. And I work with Roar, my name's Jack, and I'm one of the organizers of this series of lectures. I want to say uh, thanks as well, because these events are supported in part by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. So thanks to funding from the Connections Grant, we were able to bring Andrews over and to share this content with all of you. So please continue talking over drinks and nibbles in the next room. We do have, as mentioned, some swag. If you would like to buy books or cards, <laughs> you can talk to me. I will be manning the machine. It's at the front counter, but uh, do have a glass of wine. Enjoy the reception and take a look at the exhibition case just on your left outside the door and ask Frederick about his artistic talents there. So thanks for coming. And, and thank, thank you, Andrew. Andrew.